Good morning, Rivland Hills. My name is Doc. And I'm Michael. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning. And this is our sixth week of worshiping together online. And we're fully aware that this is not an ideal situation, but we're still super thankful for the ability to gather together as a church body to worship Jesus. If you are new to Rivland Hills, or maybe you just found us on the online stream, we would love to connect with you. If you can text hello to the number on your screen, one of our pastors would love to reach out and find out how we can best serve you this week. So we know that during this time of struggle, it may not seem overly evident that God's mercy is in play in our lives at all, uh, but His Word reminds us that His mercies are actually new every single morning. And so what we're going to do is sing about that. We're going to sing about the mercy of God that's greater than our sin, uh, the mercy of God that's new and fresh and present in our lives every morning. So join with us in worship. Having sang about God's mercy, I invite you to take a moment and turn with me to Psalm chapter 32, where we will read about God's mercy to us. Read these verses with me as we look forward into our next song, where we see the ultimate expression of God's compassion towards us with Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Join me in Psalm 32, verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. 
for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. And my iniquity, I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they will not reach him. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Verse 10, many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. sacred and for sinners such as I was it for crimes that I had done he groaned upon the tree amazing pity grace unknown and love beyond In the early 1600s, there was a German pastor named Martin Rinkert. Pastor Rinkert lived in a wall town in Saxony, and God assigned him to minister during the worst of times. Hordes of refugees poured into the town during the Thirty Years' War. Great armies crossed Central Europe year after year, pillaging shops and farms, leaving ruin and desolation. Farming activities were so interrupted by the war that famine occurred throughout Saxony. As if the calamity of war and famine were not bad enough, the plague broke out in the town. Two other ministers in town died from it, and Pastor Rinkert was left to care for the multitudes alone. All day he went from bed to bed, nursing the sick and comforting the dying. He conducted thousands of funerals, sometimes reading the funeral service over 40 or 50 bodies at once. Among the 8,000 who perished in one particular year was his own wife. But what's amazing to me is that during that time of suffering, he wrote this hymn, an astounding proclamation of thanks to God in the face of his circumstances. 
Now Thank We All Our God became a prayer around the table and is still sung centuries later. Pastor Rinkert died and went to be with the Lord one year after the 30-year war ended. But his song of thankfulness still sets an example today of living faith. Let me sing it for you. second verse very appropriate for the time we find ourselves in oh may this bounteous god through all our life be near us with ever joyful hearts and blessed peace to cheer us and keep us We understand that giving is a part of worship, so we want to say thank you, Riverland Hills family, for your faithfulness in giving. Because of that, you're making ministry happen. I think of a story I heard recently of a member of our church that works in the medical field who shared the gospel with a couple, and then they watched our worship services, and through her testimony and through watching our worship services, they received Christ as Savior and Lord of their lives. I think of hearing the story of some parents in our church that shared the gospel with, our, with their children, and three of their children came to faith in Christ. And so we just want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving and encourage you to continue to give and realize as you do that, you're impacting lives that will change their lives forever. Will you join me as we do pray together? Father, we do thank you for the privilege you've given us to worship today. And you're a gracious and good God, and we thank you for your giving of your Son, Jesus Christ, to us so that we could have a relationship with you. And so we ask your blessings on these gifts that are brought to you and your blessings on this service of worship. Thank you for giving us the privilege of being here. And we pray for Pastor Ryan as he comes to preach your word, that he will preach in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that you'll make our hearts receptive and responsive to what we hear. And we pray that everything that's done in this service We bring glory and honor to your name, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, Church family, welcome back to worship and welcome back to this time of teaching that we have together. If you'll allow me to do something today, church, what I wanna do, can can I just talk to you for a few minutes, not as Pastor Ryan, but can I just talk to you for a few minutes as person, Ryan, if you don't mind, just as a brother in Christ? We've all wrestled with this whole COVID situation. And I just wanna share with you 
um, personally, this is not as Pastor Ryan, but this is just as a brother in Christ, a fellow sojourner. Just like you, I've had questions. Uh, just like you, I've had worries. Um, just like you, I've got a lot spinning around in my mind about what's next. Of course, there's the whole weight of the church side of things about um, what's ministry gonna look like in the weeks and months to come? How do we get open back up? And all the things that go along with the weight of church ministry. But then I'm a dad, uh, I wanna take care of my family. I've got concerns that are way on my shoulders and, and different things like that. But I've gone to the Lord uh, over these past couple of weeks. Um, I started out just in, as probably many of you did, just in survival mode, that we had to adjust so quickly to a new normal. We all had to do that, and I had to do that as a person, not just as a pastor. And then about last week or a couple of weeks ago, I started reaching a point, I need all this to be over. <laughs> That's kind of the point I reached. It's a little humorous to me. I've, I've talked to some of my, my pastor friends and I was talking a, a week ago to a pastor friend that's more of an introvert, and I was telling him how I, I've got to get over this. I've got to get back with people. I, I, I'm a total people person. And him as an introvert was like, hey, I'm doing well. This is kind of a nice little break for me. So a lot of it might depend on your personality. But for me, I like being with people and I like being able to be with people. And so there's just so many adjustments we've all had to make. But here's the word the Lord's given me, and, and this is where I have landed in my own personal spiritual life, is the word hope. Friends, we always have hope. And I want you to know that God has shifted my heart from kind of a woe is me, when are things gonna get back to normal? What about all these questions that I've had? What about the ramifications of impacts on church life and my personal life and all these different things? And I've just come to where God's brought me, and it's to the word hope. And that is why in this sermon series, we have renamed it Hope Has a Name, because here's what I want you to know. As we walk through the names of God, I want you to know that God is personal. I want you to know that God is communicating to us through his word, and specifically through his names, that there's hope for you and for me. Our word of hope today is the name Jehovah Shalom. It means the Lord is peace. And couldn't we use that right now? You talk about some application. We're gonna have some application today because watch the news. Doesn't seem very peaceful right now. But I wanna let you know that Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. And we're gonna be today uh, turning to Judges chapter six. I wanna invite you to join me there in Judges chapter six. Judges is the seventh book in the Bible, start in Genesis and go seven books over to Judges chapter six. And while you're turning there, I wanna give you a little background of what's going on right now in Judges. The, where we're about to read, it's been over 200 years now since the name of God has been revealed. It's been a long time of silence, it's been a long time of, of questions. The land has been conquered uh, and divided, and there's no central government and no central place of worship. We talked a little bit last week about the temple being, being destroyed. And basically, the, the, the mantra at this time is, is basically everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so you've got now an entire generation that's forgotten the hand of God and the work of God and that's running from God. Um, rebellion, uh, they, the, what's happened with rebellion is people have tried to find peace through false gods. They've tried to find peace through material things and in their own ways they've tried to find peace. The overall pattern that you find in Judges is a very cyclical pattern. And the pattern is this, the people rebel, there's punishment because of the rebellion, the people repent and God delivers. And that's the whole theme of Judges over and over and over again, rebellion, punishment, repentance, and deliverance. And how we can relate to this, this sounds a little bit like our own personal spiritual lives. I mean, let's just be honest. We've all rebelled. We've all had moments in our life where we were running towards God and following God, and then something sidetracked us. And, and so we get in this pattern of running to God and then running from God, and that's the pattern the Israelites were in. And so maybe God's using a pandemic to get our attention. Maybe God's trying to reveal something to you and to me to show us that he's the only peace, that we're not going to find it in anything else, that it's in him and him alone. Now the key character we're gonna see in Judges chapter six is a gentleman by the name of Gideon. 
Now, God called out Gideon to free and to rescue the Israelites from this bondage that they were under. Uh, they were under slavery once again, now by the Midianites. And, and God calls out Gideon. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at what Gideon went through and how he was perplexed, how he had questions, and how he was even doubtful that God could use him and how God brought peace. It's in that context of chaos, it's in that context of rebellion, it's in that context of confusion that God reveals the name peace. The Lord is peace. Join me in uh, Judges chapter 6 in verses 23 and 24. But the Lord said to him, this being Gideon, peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. I mean, Gideon's afraid. We're going to look more into this in just a moment, but he's fearful and has good reason to be fearful because God's instructed him to be the one to go out and, and to free the Israelites. And that's a scary proposition. Then verse 24, here's how Gideon responds. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. That's the Hebrew word Jehovah Shalom. So he actually names the place where the Lord spoke to him and says, here it is. The Lord is my peace and I'm going to stand on the fact that the Lord is my peace. Now, the word shalom is a significant word. The word shalom means peace, and that's how we best understand it, and that's how we most commonly know it. But it's also used in the Old Testament to mean it's a, it's a very rich word with a lot of deep meaning. Matter of fact, if you uh, travel to Israel with us, uh, you'll hear them using the word shalom as they greet one another and shalom as they leave one another. And part of the reason for that is the word shalom means fullness. It means complete. It means finished. It means well, that all is well. So it's deeper than just peace. And I want you to hold on to that meaning of wholeness because we're going to come back to that definition in just a few moments. But first of all, I want you to understand and know that peace is available in life's roadblocks. Now, just a few weeks ago, about five, six weeks ago, we hit a major roadblock. Life as we have known it for decades stopped, and things became very, very different. Well, the Israelites uh, faced a roadblock, and I want you to see uh, the roadblock that they were facing in chapter 6. Look at verses 1 and 2. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now you talk about throwing the brakes on something. They had the brakes thrown on their life for a seven-year period. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. So instead of the people even living in the towns that they were used to living in, they're now retreating and had to run to the mountains and are hiding out in dens and caves. It's a horrible time for the Israelites. Look how it continues in verse 3. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the, the Amechalites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. So listen, they've been displaced. They're living in caves their livestock's being killed, and everything they produce in the fields is being destroyed. It is a terrible time where life has been radically changed for them, and life as they known it, have known it has totally stopped. Now, here's what I want us to understand. God uses dead ends in our life to get our attention. It doesn't have to be just a pandemic. It may be something else in your life. It may be a divorce that you've gone through or a time of grief that you faced. It might be a time of financial hardship you're going through now or that you have gone through in the past. But whatever it is, God uses things to get through our stubbornness and to get through our, our hard-headedness and, and to teach us to not be self-reliant but to, to depend on Him. God uses uses things to get our attention. So I don't want you to miss the moment right now of what God is doing and using to get your attention and how he's trying to show you. Maybe you've looked to the wrong things to find peace. Maybe you've tried the wrong things in your life to find peace. And what God wants you to understand in this season, in the history of your life, is that he is the Prince of Peace in your life. 
So there's peace available when there's times of, of dead ends in our life. There's peace available, second of all, in moments of disobedience. Now, welcome to the club of disobedience. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There's not one righteous, no, not one. We've all dropped the ball, we've all rebelled, and we've all disobeyed. And the Israelites, God's chosen people, they had moments where they trusted God and followed him, and then they had moments where they radically rebelled. We can relate to this. I love the honesty of Scripture. It's one of the things I love about it. I love how the Scripture doesn't try to paint some pretty perfect picture. What it shows is reality. And in verse 10, I want you to see this. God says, And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. That God calls them out. Look, you've, you've, been, you've been disobedient. You've uh, run from the Lord and you've been very disobedient in what you've done. You've looked to the wrong things to try to find peace in life. We often lose peace, uh, first of all, when we rebel. A lot of times in times of uh, trial and times of struggle that we go through, oftentimes we'll shake our fist at God and we'll start blaming Him. But there are certainly times in life that what's happened is we don't have peace because we've moved, we've rebelled. So maybe it's possible that we don't have peace right now because of our own rebellion. Or a second reason we might not have peace is because we just forget who God's been and what God's done. Israelites forgot often. And look at chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. When the people cried out to the Lord on account of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. What God's saying here is how, now that you're under bondage with the Midianites, how in the world can you forget that I brought you out of slavery from Israel? We are so forgetful. And one of the techniques you can be doing right now, if you're worried, if you've lost peace, one of the things you can do right now is to remember the remember who God's been and remember God's track record. We get busy in life and we forget God's track record. And maybe right now what God's trying to do is he's just trying to help us remember what he's done and his track record. I've been reflecting back this week just on Riverland Hills. Um, I've just been thinking about just what, 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 an, what a fascinating and phenomenal um, almost uh, moving on towards a 52-year journey we've now had in the life of our church that we started out in a classroom at Irmo High School uh, that God gave our, our, our original members that started out the vision to buy property and to build on St. Andrew's Road, that over those years, God gave the church the vision to expand, to make room for more people. Then we had a huge step of faith, a challenging step of faith. Were we going to relocate or not? And God you know, gave us the vision to relocate. And since we've re relocated, we've watched God double us in the number of people that we have in our church family, the number of people we've been able to reach. And we've watched right here in this location how we've been able to grow and to reach more people. So time after time after time again, God's track record is he always gets us through over and over again. So we need to understand that there's peace available to us in dead-end moments when you wonder what's going on. There's peace available to us in those disobedient moments. There's peace available to us in times of questioning. Boy, are there questions right now. There's all types of questions out there. And I, I've got great news for you. Gideon had questions. Watch this. Look in chapter 6, starting in verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, that's Gideon, to Gideon, and said to Gideon, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Great question. If God is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And he goes on and says, And where are all of his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given, given us into the hand of Midian. I mean, here, Gideon stands being called out to, 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 to save Israel. And what's Gideon doing? He's asking questions. God, where are you in all this? What, what are you doing? 
And here's, here's some good news I want you to know that's encouraging to me and it should be encouraging to you. I find it fascinating that God would choose to use someone that asks questions. <laughs> it's great news for you. It's great news for me because I got a long list of questions right now. But here's what we do in faith. What we do in faith is we trust who God is. And peace is this. Os Oswald Sanders said this. Peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of God. So peace doesn't mean that everything's going our way. Peace doesn't mean that every day is always perfect. What peace means is that with us through all of it, we have the very presence of God. And we understand that in the midst of that, it's okay to have questions. It's okay to have those questions because if we're seeking the Prince of Peace, what we're going to learn is we're going to discover and find that peace is a person. Peace is not some big concept, that peace is a person. And so as we seek those answers, we find those in the person of Christ alone. There's peace available to us not only in times of questioning, but there's peace available to us when I feel limited. I mean, how about feeling limited right now? I mean, we're stuck. I mean, we feel limited on the ways we can shop, how we can shop, when can we shop. Uh, we feel limited because we can't even come to the church like we're used to doing. We feel limited in our ability to see families and loved ones that we wanna see. Uh, we've been in limited in the way we conduct funerals. We've been limited in the way we have birthday parties. I mean, it's been all over the place how we feel limited. Now, look at Gideon. He felt extremely limited. Look at this uh, in verses 14 through 16. Again, I love the honesty of Scripture. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. I love this, because I can relate to this. Here's Gideon saying, uh, God, I think, you, I think you dialed the wrong number. <laughs> I think you have officially called the wrong person. Don't you know that my clan is the weakest? And don't you know that I'm the least in my clan? In other words, I got a double whammy. I don't have much going for me, and I'm in the clan that doesn't have much going for it. So surely you did not mean that you were calling me to do this, because I am so limited. And I love God's answer. God always gives an answer. And the answer is this, and I love this. And the Lord said to him, verse 16, but I will be with you. Hmm. Great answer. How, how do we move forward when we feel limited? How do we make it when we feel isolated? How do we make it when we feel weak? incapable, not, a, not able to do it when things seem totally out of our control. How do we do it? I'll tell you how we do it. We realize that God is with us and we're never alone. I love to travel. Uh, one of the, and that, that's one of the things that's been a struggle for me. We've talked about, we just want to run down to the beach for an afternoon and just see the coast. And a few weeks ago, before all the social distancing started, we went up to the mountains to hike. And I love to fly. I love to go places. I've always just loved doing that. Never forget a trip Heather and I went on and when we lived uh, up in Hendersonville, North Carolina, and we were flying back into the Asheville Regional Airport. And if you've ever flown into that airport before, um, most of the planes that fly in there are more of the regional jets. And uh, the, 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 the airport is between a lot of mountains. It's just a flat, plateaued spot between a lot of mountains. So because of that, you get a lot of uh, straight line winds that come through and a lot of bouncing around when you go to land in Asheville very often. And we were on this uh, small regional jet flying in. The plane got extremely turbulent, bouncing like crazy. I feel like the thing's gonna crash. We're almost about to land on the runway and you hear the engines roaring and that pilot takes right back off before he even hits the runway, takes back off and we get back up and we start circling around again. He tries that three more times. And the entire time as we're circling around, he circles over Hendersonville, North Carolina, and we're at such a low altitude, we're like, oh, there's our church and there's our house. You can just drop me off right there if we're gonna keep doing this because it was bouncing after bouncing after bouncing. Um, I know people's fingernail marks were in those armrests. It was crazy, crazy flying. But every time we would go into land and the straight line winds were too much, he would, he would uh, go back up again and start circling one more time. He would come back every time 
the calmest of any of us on the flight. All of us in the back, nervous wreck, right? The pilot, sorry about that, folks. Some rough turbulence. Want you to know we're going to be okay. We're going to find a smooth cruising altitude, and we're going to circle around a little bit more, and we're going to try again. Now, what amazes me about that, I'm looking out the window, and it looks like the wing could fall off of this plane. I know it's not, but when you watch it bouncing around and shaking the way it was and the way the plane felt, I'm like, this thing's going to fall apart it's what it feels like. But the captain's completely at peace and in total control. Right now, we're in a little bit of turbulence, aren't we? And we're in a rough, rough time right now. But I want you to know that beyond the turbulence, there's always smooth air. And the one we trust to get us there is the captain. And what I love about the captain is the captain is at peace and the captain is calm. And so I want you to know that no matter what you're facing right now, that, that God is in control, even when we feel like life's out of control, even when we feel limited, just like Gideon felt limited. We all feel that way at certain times in our life. Lastly, I want you to understand that there's peace available to make you whole. Now, this goes back to what I talked about just a few minutes ago about the word shalom itself, that that word shalom means peace, it means wholeness, it means finished, it means full, it means perfect. Basically, the main idea of Jehovah Shalom is this, it's wholeness in one's relationship with God. It's not that you have a part relationship with God, a partial relationship with God, but you have wholeness in your walk, in your relationship with God. There's a passage in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 that says that peace passes or surpasses, it transcends our understanding, and it will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What I love about that verse is it says peace transcends our understanding. Are there things I don't understand right now? Absolutely. Are there questions you have and things you don't understand right now? We're all in that same boat. But here's what we need right now is we need a peace that supersedes our minds. We need a peace that supersedes our emotions. And that's what this peace is that's offered to us. Over in John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus himself said this, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. That Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace, came so that you and I could have peace. It's very possible that the lesson that God wants you to learn through COVID-19 is the issue of peace. Some of you have dabbled in everything known to man to find peace. You've tried more money, you've tried more popularity, You've tried every drug or substance known to man. You've tried multiple relationships. Uh, you've tried bigger and better vacations. You name it, you've tried it, and you thought that that would bring you peace, only to discover you continue in that revolving door of never being settled. Well, the only way that you're going to be settled in peace is to know the Prince of Peace. Uh, you will not know the peace of God until you personally know the God of peace. Or, to put it this way, peace is not a concept to talk about, but it's a person to know. Well, Pastor, how in the world can I, as messed up as I am, and all that I struggle with, and all of my hangups that I have, how in the world could I ever have peace? And here's how you would have peace. It's by receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's by you coming to Him and saying, Lord, I admit to you that I am a sinner. It's a prayer that you can pray directly to God. You don't need a church building, and you don't need a pastor. It's just between you and God to be able to come to Him and say, Lord, I admit that I am a sinner, and I admit that I've fallen short of your plan, and I come in faith, and I receive your Son, Jesus. Jesus Christ and the grace that you've offered me. Thank you for forgiving me and thank you for shedding your blood for me and thank you for saving me. Uh, if you've prayed that prayer, we want to help you in your journey. Maybe you have more questions before you made a decision to pray to receive Christ and you just want to talk with one of us. Well, you can do that by uh, texting the keyword that's on the screen. We'd love to be able to talk with you this week. Uh, you can email me directly at pastor uh, at riverlandhills.org. And I would love this week just to be able to follow up with you as well. We do not want you to walk through your spiritual journey alone. Yes, we're in a season right now where life feels isolated, but we're still a church family and we're still here for you and we want to be able to walk with you no matter where you find yourself in life. You may have heard before about 
two artists that uh, were in competition with one another, and they decided to have a competition by painting peace. In other words, what would peace look like if you painted it? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind would be something like um, a tranquil beach scene or uh, Caribbean uh, clear blue waters with white sand and a beautiful sunset uh, right behind it. Or a piece for you might be uh, sitting in a rocking chair up in the mountains with a cool breeze blowing through as you're looking over the beauty of God's creation. Uh, so these artists were in this battle. And of course, one artist, what he did is he painted the perfect beach scene and he painted calm waters, he painted the most beautiful sunset that you've ever seen, and uh, he knew for sure that he was gonna be the one to win the competition because of the beauty of his picture. The second painter, interestingly enough, he painted the scene of a storm. And this storm was a chaotic picture with a chaotic storm, the sky was painted dark, there were lightning strikes, um, and, and you could see the dark clouds rolling through his picture. I mean, it almost looked like a Category 5 hurricane if you looked at, at the picture that he painted. But what was interesting was in the very corner of that chaotic storm picture, there were two rocks. And if you looked real closely in that corner between those two rocks, you saw the picture of a bird. And there was a bird that was safe and singing. And believe it or not, he's the one that won that competition on what real peace looks like. You see, we try to paint our own picture of peace, what we think it should look like. But peace only works if it works in the storms. Peace only works if it works in the darkest and most difficult times in life. And so right now, you need to understand that peace is a person that peace is not some big, vague concept, but it's a person that you can know. And peace is something that we enjoy in the midst of the current storm of COVID-19. We're here for you, and we want to help you know, discover, and walk in that peace. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, in the midst of the storm, we know that you are the God of peace, you're the Prince of Peace, Lord, I thank you that peace is not some far off concept, but it's a personal loving heavenly father that loves each one of us. And I pray, Father, that we would experience the peace that only comes from you, that you would give it to those who are wrestling and struggling right now. Lord, we as uh, your children, we get to rest in the peace that you're in absolute control and you're gonna pull us through this storm. And we know it beyond a shadow of a doubt, we have confidence in you, we have confidence in what you're doing, we have confidence in what you're teaching us. And so Lord, I pray that this week for each person listening, that you would give them that peace that passes all understanding when our minds go crazy, when our emotions go crazy. Lord, that you would give us that peace that calms us. Thank you, Father, for giving us a peace that's not of this world, but a peace that's out of this world. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <music>